Snap Judgment Studios. Daily Show correspondent Dulce Sloan and writer Josh Johnson are best friends who rarely agree on anything. On the new podcast called Hold Up with Dulce Sloan and Josh Johnson, they turn their hilarious, unpredictable, and legendary office banter into a war of words about topics big and small, mostly small, from texting versus calling to club bangers versus conscious rap and everything in between. Listen to Hold Up with Dulce Sloan and Josh Johnson from The Daily Show every Thursday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, for some people, their outsized talent, their perseverance, tenacity, their focus, it actually pays off. Folk know who they are when they walk down the street. That's the woman who did that thing. She's right there. Oh, she comes to my coffee shop every morning. Are you serious? They get the nods. The crowds part. People want to take their picture because of their great accomplishment. But outside of achievements and fantastic deeds, well, that's a lot of hard work. And if our American experiment proves anything, it demonstrates that for fame and adulation, even for votes, attainment and knowledge are wholly unnecessary. Because there's a second, a quicker, easier path to glory. Just make an ass of yourself. And that's why, on Snap Judgment from WNYC Studios, we proudly present Notorious. Amazing stories from real people who, for whatever reason, all eyes are on them. My name is Lynn Washington. Would you please tell Kim Kardashian to stop calling me? Because you're listening to Snap Judgment. Now, we're going to kick off today's notorious episode in the land of my birth. You see, Phil Locke, he's a pull yourself up from the bootstraps kind of guy from Flint, Michigan. And this is a story about how he went from scrappy to styling in the way that only Phil can. Phil Locke will tell you that school, it's not his thing. He wasn't a big reader, so, well... Sort of. Yes, Donald Trump, the art of the deal. Right, that was uh, one of my attempted reads. But he's still got to put bread on the table, right? He had no degree, but no worries. Let's take a look at his resume. It kicks off with the pawn shop. Started uh, developing a golf training device called Sway Away. Started a bar restaurant, bath and body stores. We never opened. I got cold feet doing so. (laughs) He even tried politics. I ran for office. When I was defeated by a, I think, 21-year incumbent at the time, so I moved to Telluride, Colorado to be a ski bum. Met my wife. It was our 19th anniversary in September. Oh, congratulations. (laughs) Thank you, thank you. Then he tried selling timeshare, then eyeglasses. Which I failed at miserably. So anyways, you know there's that saying that defeat only makes you stronger? Well, for Phil, his failed businesses got him into bankruptcy. So he found himself washing golf clubs at a Hyatt in Orlando. Where I clean Michael Jordan's clubs, Jackie Chan's clubs. You know, successful people. It was cool, but the majority of the money I made was tips, right? But but the little check that I did get for my hourly wage, I, I couldn't put it in the bank because I was in bankruptcy. So I'd take my little $100 check, and I would go to Orange Blossom Trail, the little seedy street in Orlando, and I would go to a check cashing place to, to cash it. And when I was there, they would offer these short-term loans, these payday loans. And what's that? A payday loan is a short-term loan to get you through any financial unexpected need that might come up until your next payday. It's similar to a pawn shop, but instead of the pawnbroker keeping the item until you repay the loan, a payday store charges an X amount of dollar or percent as interest per $100 loaned. And, And that was an aha moment. The light turned on. I'm driving a a U-Haul truck with my belongings from Orlando, you know, to move back into Michigan, into my my in-law's basement. And I thought, wow, you know, what a great business this will be if the saturation isn't in Michigan of these type of operations. 
He was right. The market for payday stores was untapped in Michigan, so he went for it. He found a little storefront. A lower class. It's a very rough area. He printed out some signs, installed some bulletproof glass, and voila, he was open for business. His interest rate? The state requirement of $16.50 per $100 borrowed. And my goal was that I hit in the third week, if I could just lend out $10,000 a week, that was $1,650 potential profit. He figured it would take him a couple months to get to that mark. But I met that goal in the third week, and it just started growing from there. Phil wanted to grow his business. But in order to lend more money, you need more money. So he ran ads in the Detroit Free Press that read, Cash Cow, Working Partners Needed. People were calling me, asking me, what is this cash cow? Phil promised that his business could get 400% back on their investments over time. And sure enough, he delivered. Soon he brought on old friends, strangers, and trust fund kids in on the action. Within a year, his store was lending out $100,000 a week and generating roughly $50,000 a month in fees. My reaction was, woohoo! You know, it was almost like winning the lottery. You know, I've been searching for the past 10 years for a successful business, whatever it may be. You know, I'm on to something. I built my wife and I a beautiful house. My wife had a BMW X5, a Mercedes SUV, a uh, Range Rover Sport, Porsche Boxster. Wife had Rolex watches. I had nice Rolex watches. I would say that it felt good. It felt really good compared to how I grew up. The guy, you know, kicking and screaming to, you know, get his way out of Flint. They were profitable based on the $16.50 per hundred that we would charge. At that time, we had collection methods in place that were were fair, uh, or it was based, maybe not fair, but it was the state law. Well, in the state of Michigan, for any bounce check, it doesn't matter, it, you can sue for triple damages plus $250 in court cost. Bankruptcy was a big part of the business. Phil says at his shops, only 10% of his customers would file for bankruptcy. But for the rest of his clients, Phil was offering a service that he believed people genuinely needed, like a quick loan for an unexpected family medical cost. But still, not everyone was on board. One time, he was trying to get one of his close business mentors to join in. He is the smartest businessman I've ever met in my entire life. I'm just now starting to expand rapidly. I've got, And I said, hey, you know, come help me take the reins. And he said, Phil, you have a very profitable business. However, I can't get my arms around this business for the simple reason is the products that you offer are morally acceptable. I wouldn't want my daughters to use when they're of age. I wouldn't recommend them for my aunt to use if she was short on her mortgage payment. Phil's mentor said that the interest rates, while they were average across the country, it was not something he could stomach because it took advantage of the poor who were stuck in this vicious cycle of debt. With high interest rates and short repayment periods of usually two weeks, some consumers find themselves unable to repay the loan in time. So they take out another loan to pay for the first one. Repeat. I mean, there is this thing of a cycle of debt, but my response was, I just don't think they get it. I don't think they understand the business model because everybody takes advantage of the poor. And at the time, were you proud of your business? Yeah, absolutely. I could say I was proud of my work. I mean, I took nothing. I came from bankruptcy and I built a chain from zero to over 40 payday loan stores within five years. At the peak, I was making seven figures. Phil even became the president of the Michigan Financial Service Centers Association, basically the leading advocate for the industry in his state. He frequently traveled to DC and schmoozed policymakers about the need to protect payday lenders from any regulation. He would tell lawmakers about the good payday testimonies, how the loan came in clutch in an emergency situation, but leave out some of the truth, like the cycle of debt and bankruptcy. 
We were going from, you know, one meeting to the other, and we had to take off our name badges because there was a bunch of people, they're outside with fishing poles with sharks on the end that were legalized loan sharks. As Tony Montana puts it in Scarface, you know, I'm the guy that, you know, they point their finger at. I'm the bad guy. I'm the bad guy. Do I mind that? No. I'm, you know, I'm from the streets of Flint, Michigan. There was one time that I saw a high school friend of mine getting out of his car, coming into the storefront. I, I was embarrassed. So I turned around, jumped back behind the bulletproof glass, I shut the door and hid in the corner until the transaction was done. I felt badly. His chart was very long. You know, any other customer was fine. I don't know. I, I I don't know what to say. Then a few weeks later, he came in, and I was there. I brought him back, caught up with him. Eventually, I said, hey, you got to stop doing this. You got to stop coming in here every week. We need to get you out of this financial trap. I made arrangements to get him out of that. But Phil found out that right after his friend left his payday store, The friend walked into the competitors just around the block to apply for another loan. While he felt bad, he still continued running his business and let the good times roll. And then an unexpected thing happened. The governor of Michigan started cracking down on the industry, calling for reforms to change their interest rate from a flat $16.50 per hundred to $15 per hundred, then $14, then $13, and so on. This would mean a 20% drop in revenue for Phil's investors. So he fought it. I tried. I tried really hard. I donated a lot of money. I bought new clothes. I spent every waking moment fighting it against this law. But I mean, I had, I don't know, a half a dozen stores, partners, close their doors before the law even went into effect. They're like, we can't make money doing this. But as hard as he tried, he claims that the governor cut a deal with Phil's biggest competitor, the national payday chain, and ultimately, the bill passed under his watch. Of my partners, they started having these confidential meetings to get together to sue me because I didn't protect them enough. Oh, and a lot of these people I went to high school with and would go on spring break with when I was growing up. And a lot of them were friends of mine for 15 years. I became very depressed. Everything blew up at once a week before my daughter's first birthday. My philosophy was my daughter growing up has all the material things that she ever wanted. Is that what I want my one-year-old to know where daddy got his wealth from taking advantage of the poor? I caved in mentally to the point that I don't want this greed in my life anymore. I should do something about this. But what do I do? And and that's where I, I chose to turn my back on the industry and to go fight for the consumer. Enough was enough. I decided to go out there and educate lawmakers about how the payday loan companies are taking advantage of the consumers and what we can do to change this. Phil decided to sell and get rid of everything. His houses, cars, jewelry, artwork. Then he bought a motorhome and traveled to state capitals and D.C. to fight for consumers. He made a website, $10phil.com, to advocate for a lower national interest rate, $10 per hundred. Was I making change for revenge? Yes. But I wanted to make a difference for the consumer. It would help the neediest. You know, my wife, she supported me, as she always has. And a couple people said, hey, Phil, you're, you're messing with billionaires. You know, it's, it's not going to be successful. You, you probably couldn't have told me that. I was very optimistic that I could make a difference. I woke up each day uh, with my kids. I would go for a walk, and then I would reach out to these people. 
He even signed a transfer of ownership to get rid of his payday store chain for good. Then he reached out to Congressman Oprah, Howard Stern, Ellen, Nightline, 60 Minutes. He also wrote a short book called Greed, The Dark Side of Predatory Lending. But, wow, nobody wanted to hear about this subject. Just no answer. It wasn't even a nope. In my experience, all these do-gooder organizations, all these congressmen that reach out and speak about this industry, nobody really cares. It, nobody truly cares about the poor. If they really wanted an insider for these industries, that they would have at least reached out and spoken with me. It's like, you know, so if nobody cares, then why should I? And, and I can't make a difference. I failed. It cost me a lot of money, it cost me grief with my family, and I failed. So today, Phil is back at square one. I'm back home doing what I did before, uh, subprime lending, predatory lending. You know during the time when Phil was crusading against the dark side of the payday industry? Well, he still legally owned his payday stores. In the transfer of ownership to the stores that I had left, the ink wasn't even dry on the contracts to transfer ownership. It needed state approval. My partners would never sign off on that approval. And so we canceled the ownership transfer. And so ultimately, my business never went away. But now his chain is much smaller due to the bill that was passed. You know, I still have four or five stores left. Stores that are still open and operating that are providing a living for my children. They're there, right. I I mean, on a day-to-day basis, I have nothing to do with my stores. So you're okay, like, running these remaining payday stores despite being this payday crusader not too long ago? I am... You know, I don't know that, you know, I'm okay with it uh, because it's my single source of income at this point to support my young family. I mean, you do what you have to do, right? Some people, uh, you know, steal to to support their family. Some people do a lot of different things that they don't want to do to support their family. It is what it is. It's what makes me who I am, right? Good, bad, or other, you know, whatever somebody's going to call me, maybe a hypocrite because I, I made money off the industry and then I wanted to make a change. You know, whatever it may be, it's what makes me who I am today. But right now, it's just my search for my next career move to support my family. Thank you, Phil Locke, for sharing your story with the Snap. Now, Phil says he's working on some new programs that will revolutionize the payday industry. Stay tuned for that. And a big shout out as well to writer Gary Rivlin for first bringing us this story. I'll we'll have a link to Gary's article at snapjudgment.org. The original score was done by Leon Morimoto, and that story was produced by Davey Kim. Now, when Snap Judgment returns, what if you have the most unfortunate name of all time? Find out in just a moment. The Notorious episode continues. Stay tuned. Attention shoppers, we now have Taste in the Bread Aisle, Dave's Killer Bread. That's right. An organic bread that's no longer a sedative for your taste buds. Dave's Killer Bread is on a mission to make the most of the loaf. To rid the world of GMOs, high fructose corn syrup, and artificial ingredients. And plant the seeds of good in all that they bake. Killer taste, killer texture, always organic. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread amplified. Using Talkspace feels a little like having a mental health professional in your pocket. Talkspace offers both therapy and psychiatry, and being able to reach out to a provider anytime, anywhere, makes addressing mental health super easy, and getting started is the most important part. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, 
go to Talkspace.com. Make sure to use the code JUDGMENT to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's JUDGMENT and Talkspace.com. Welcome back to Snap Judgment, the notorious episode. Today we're talking to people in the public eye for stuff they didn't really have a lot to do with. Now, one of our producers here at Snap, Joe Rosenberg, I've been on his case for years, for years, to share one of his own personal stories on the Snap. People need to know the contradictions and chaos that is Joe Rosenberg. And Joe, he always finds a way to wiggle out of it. Always has some excuse. Always no good. People be bored. I look at the time, but this time, I got him. Just a few weeks ago, caught Joe starting to tell one of his little tales to Jasmine Aguilera. I was like, no, you don't. Get into the studio, the both of you. And I press record. So, Joe, I know Glenn stopped us, but you got to tell me the rest of the story. Okay. So this story um, begins on, like, my very first day of college. Okay. Like orientation? Yeah. At, like, one of those orientation meetings, which they make you go to in order to register for classes and get your student ID and whatever else you need to do to... Yeah. Start being a student in earnest. You know what I'm talking about. And so, like, the auditorium must have had 200 people in it. But I recognized a girl from my dorm who I was going to end up being good friends with. So we sat next to each other. Was while... she cute? Incidentally, yes. <laughs> but we sit down next to each other while an administrator takes attendance. And, of course, no one in the auditorium, ourselves included, is paying the slightest bit of attention. Every, everyone's just kind of making small talk. And you're just kind of waiting around for her to get to your respective sure. letter of the alphabet. And yeah. she's kind of in the... I remember she was kind of in the H's and she's going, you know, Rebecca Henson here, Todd Higuchi here, Timothy Hitler here, Jonathan Hollister here. And I'm like, I'm super mind numbingly boring. But then I'm like, wait, wait, what, what did I, what was that? And I interrupt my new friend mid sentence and I was like, did you just hear that? And she's like, hear what? And I said, I think that woman just registered a Hitler. And she's like, what are you talking about? And I said, she called out Hitler's name. There is a Hitler here among us. (laughs) And my friend just looks at me and she's like, I didn't hear anything. And so I glance around and everyone around me seems perfectly calm, like nothing had happened. But I knew what I had heard. So when I got back to the dorm, I told my dorm mates what happened. But they had this rebuttal, which is like, you must have misheard because how is it even possible for someone to go through life with the name Hitler? Besides, like, you know, they're pointing out. And not change it. And not change it because, like, you just have to imagine, like, going to a job interview, going through airport security, like, ordering a pizza. And they're like, and they're they're pointing out, like, you know, that by my own admission, like, no one else heard anything. But just to make sure, like, we decided to look through the class directory. And this is back when the class directory is, like, literally called the Facebook, you know, which is, like, you open it up and there's the face and the name. And there's, like, nothing. There's no Hitler. And um, at this point, I'm starting to wonder whether I had imagined the whole thing. And my friends are like, okay, come on, Joe. It's a funny thought, but just put it away. And I kind of do, but I kind of don't. Because I secretly continued to ponder this potentially very real person who might be out there named Timothy Hitler. And so... Over the years, I would wonder about him, and, you know, I would wonder why he had held on to a name like that. And I pictured some version where he gets really defensive and saying, like, it's an old family name that other man has nothing to do with it. (laughs) You know, like, I'm not going to let one person mar an otherwise perfectly good name. And so mostly he's just this figure in my head. But, you know, at the same time, I'm always, like, now on the lookout. And every now and then, you know, I think I heard something. Right, because are you familiar with this thing called Godwin's Law? No, I'm not. So Godwin's Godwin's Law is like the longer a debate or intense conversation goes on, the more the probability that someone compares something to Hitler increases to 100%. Right, okay. So like the word Hitler is like used in conversation actually like a lot. Right. And particularly when you're in college and everyone's debating everything and, you know, you're not really good at debating in college. So you go straight to the Hitler comparison. Like, you know who else was a vegetarian? Hitler. Hitler. And so you're just like in the dining hall, um, in the hallways, whatever, and you're just hearing like, nah, 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 Hitler, you know, and you're just like, wait, what? Hitler, do you know him? You know, and they're like, what? No, what do you mean? What do you mean I do I know Hitler? And they're like, no, sorry, never mind. I forget I, oh my God, forget I mentioned anything. <laughs> and, and so eventually I, I come to the conclusion, along with everyone else, that there is no Hitler who goes to my school, and it was just a, a, a silly freshman fantasy. Until 
the end of my senior year, four years later, I go to the student clinic with the flu. And as I was sitting there in the waiting room, like kind of like half dead to the world, like conked out on cough suppressants, I heard something over the PA system. The PA system comes on and I just hear, Hitler, Timothy P, Hitler, <laughs> Timothy P, please report to radiology. Again, Hitler, please report to radiology. At which point, like, my, my flu just, like, disappears. And I just, like, bolt upright in my chair. And I'm like, it's Hitler! <laughs> right? It, like, he's here! Right? And I'm, like, looking around the waiting room for some, like, sign of commotion. But it was kind of like I'm back in this recurring dream. Because, like, everyone's calm. And I'm just like, what is wrong with these people? Like, where is Hitler? Right? And then I remembered. I was like, radiology! They said radio. He had to report to radiology, right? And so, like, I kind of, like, dashed out into the hall. And, like, I asked a group of nurses, like, where radiology was. But they're not quite sure. They're like, it's in a different wing. It's far away. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm like, go find it, right? And, I, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm starting to, like, walk down these halls, like, looking for radiology. And I can't find radiology. And I'm just getting completely turned around. And at this point, my flu is, like ebbing back in and I'm just getting like the, the adrenaline high is just right. like is wearing off and um, suddenly I remember like how sick I was so I just kind of walked back into the clinic and I went in to see the doctor and you know in the midst of kind of the checkup you know with her like listening to my chest and asking me to cough I said you know a few minutes ago someone just paged Hitler and she just looked at me and she said, I didn't hear anything. So wait, that can't be, that can't be the only, that, so, so you didn't find him? What happened after that? After, that was a kind of really demoralizing experience. I kind of thought, oh, I, I had no hope of ever finding this guy. And I put it out of my mind. Uh, my but there, there, there has to be, there has to be other Hitlers. Oh, like other other people whose names, uh, other people. family name is Hitler and yeah. it just wasn't changed. Yeah. I mean, how many, like... Hitler, when Hitler was Hitler, must have not only been the only Hitler. There must be others. Okay, well, this is this is a good this is a, this is a good thought. I, I I will I will look at these other Hitlers and get back to you. There we go. Okay, so Jasmine. Yeah. Good news. Uh, this was not hard. Oh, um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Did you get a Hitler? I got two Hitlers. I'm Leanne Hitler Meads. My name's Susanna Hitler Brown. So Hitler's their maiden name? Uh, yeah, that's their maiden name. And they're actually two out of four sisters. I'm the oldest. And then we have Belinda, Susanna, and then our little bonus sister, Jennifer Hitler. Not even a bonus brother. It was sisters all down the line. Nope, never got the brother. Maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> People want to avoid pronouncing it. Well, that's true. They want to pronounce it every other way. Hitler, or yeah. um, uh, that's the first one that comes Hitter. to Hitter. Hitter. Yeah. And they just kind of, um, uh, hit, hit, uh, how do you pronounce this? <laughs> they're, they're afraid of offending us by pronouncing it yeah. the right way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. Hitler. So, wait a minute. Are they related to the actual Hitler? Uh, no, they're not. But they do come, they say, from a long, proud line of Hitlers. When three Hitler brothers boarded uh, the ship Peggy and ended up in Maryland in 1760. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, the ship Peggy? Yeah. We've actually got the manifest, a copy of the manifest, but it doesn't say what port they got on. But they know that their ancestor is one of those three brothers. And his son falsified his birth certificate so he could fight in the Revolutionary War in 1776. So we have Hitler, the national hero, here. Uh, yeah, and that Hitler actually went on to marry the daughter of one of George Washington's most trusted lieutenants before going on to homestead in the Ohio River Valley. And so, fortunately for us, yeah, we, we you, have this great heritage. We have a really great heritage. And that's what we connect with is this family that we heard about for our whole lives. And so after World War II, their dad, Gene Hitler, he wasn't too inclined to change the family name. It's say, why should I? It's a great name. Just because some guy happened to ruin it for others, why should he have to ruin it for me? It's easy I, to spell, easy yeah. to pronounce. I have a great family. And my, you have to know my dad. He is 
if you looked up stubborn in the in, <laughs> in the dictionary, his name would be next to it. So, growing up, when was the first time that you became aware, you know, either in kindergarten or at home, that you know that something was up here with the name? Well, you have to you have to realize that there wasn't a day that went by that someone didn't comment about our name or ask us about our name. Yeah. It was a, a daily occurrence. The and grocery it was usually store, the post office. Like if you were to order something out and go pick it up, you couldn't leave your name <laughs> because you'd go to pick it up and they Always. didn't have it prepared because they thought it was a joke. And and we we actually, growing up, we actually pulled our name from the phone book because we got so many prank phone calls. Especially in junior high. Oh, junior high is bad. It was in junior high that Leanne tried to be really involved in school. And I decided when I was in eighth grade that I would run for a ninth grade student buddy office. And somehow I thought the person that I had become would would overshadow the the name. So I, you know, had my campaign and I made my little posters and put them up in the halls and it was within short order that they all had swastikas on them or oh. they would have, you know, a, 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 a smiley face kind of, you know, character with a mustache on it or something. And so, you know, I just trudged forward and it got to the last assembly. And so I got up and in the middle of giving my speech, a bunch of the kids in the back of the auditorium started doing see Kyle Hitler and don't vote her in. She'll throw you in the gas chambers. And then they goose stepped forward in the aisle. And finally, one of the administration just kind of ushered me off the stage. And, and that, that was probably the hardest one. Yeah. Were, were, were any of your sisters close enough to you in age that they were in the audience? No. I was paving the way, you know, as a little junior high student there. And, and you know, it was hard. That was hard. My dad always called her the experimental model. From that experience, what did your parents say about it? Were they equipped to, to tell you how to handle it or to, to reassure you? And you I'm know, curious, did you like... I, I was a little puddle. I was a little puddle. And mom just said, you know, we had the name long before Adolf had to ruin it. And so for us, it's, a, it, it's our name. It's who we are. So you just have to be able to, somehow or other, you've got to be able to sort this out and separate it from you versus him. I... Hmm... Jasmine, you don't approve of this plan? This is hard. I'm like torn between completely agreeing with their parents and being like, you're your own person and this is our family name. And then also just the pragmatic side of me is like, yeah, but you're putting your kids through this unnecessarily rough. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I did ask them about that. And they said that they were never really angry at their parents for keeping the name. And in part, that's because one of the things their parents were trying to teach them and and one of the things they were actually getting really good at even before this event at the school assembly was learning to just make a joke of it, you know, kind of turn into the skid. Like if you got a prank phone call, I mean, this happened every so often. Oh, yeah. They'd say, I want to talk to Adolf. And we'd say, yeah, just a minute, hang on. And <laughs> the phone would the phone would go <laughs> dead. Yeah, they'd, no, they'd hang, hang up. up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I remember walking down the hall and a bunch of kids would give me the C. Kyle, two or three that stand there like at attention, and I'd say something like, you know, at ease. And our dad tended to, you know, I think he just got a kick out of it. Yeah. Right. He did have an occasion where someone asked him why he didn't change his name, and he said that he had, that his family's <laughs> name was originally Mussolini. <laughs> And they changed it to Hitler and picked another winner. (laughs) That's right. That's a dad joke right there, if I ever heard one. I know. You could, yeah, it is such a dad joke. But I got to tell you, I think uh, out of all these jokes and techniques that they used to kind of diffuse the situation, the ultimate masterstroke was Leanne's nickname. My nickname in high school for a really long time was just Hitler. I I never went by Leanne, very seldom. Unless it was a teacher that called me Leanne. Everybody called me Hitler. And they go, oh, Hitler, how you doing? You know, and it, and, it, and it wasn't offensive. It wasn't offensive. And so... Even your friends. Even Oh, yeah, my very closest friends call me Hitler all the time. 
And I, and I can't stress enough how throughout the interview how genuinely comfortable they were by this point with the name. And in fact, when Sue got married and had the chance to just get rid of the Hitler name entirely. I still chose not to because I ended up keeping my Hitler name as a middle name. Same. I and did the so same on thing. my driver's license, it's spelled out. It's not even an initial. It's written out. So even though it's a name that most people, you know, kind of recoil when they hear it, for me, it's, it's just who I am. So now that they've decided to keep the name, they have a different problem. Really, the, the family name has really died out as far as our particular a line of, has. A lot of girls. A lot of girls were born in the family. Leanne says that if you looked in the New York City phone book prior to World War II, there used to be hundreds of listings for Hitlers. But you look today, there isn't one. Mm, so every, all those other people either changed their names or didn't have children? Yeah. And uh, Leanne and Sue's family is just one of the very few that managed to thread the needle. There's some still in Ohio. Yeah, we know that there are some up in the Indiana area, but we've not been able to connect with them. It's just a handful of us. There's just a handful, yeah. So when I got married and we started having children, I just said, you know, how do you feel about us inserting that as a middle name for any of our children? And he, and he really did not want to do that. He yeah. said, my husband didn't do that. Yeah. Let me push back on that and ask, like, why give your children that battle to fight? And that that was my husband's exact mine, argument. So. And I understand that. I said, but that, that means our name will be Gone. lost because we're the, the, the family daughters, line. only daughters. And my husband, he says, well, that's probably a good thing. And I was a little <laughs> offended. Yeah, me too. Uh, it made me feel a little bit bad that like, we didn't get to, to pass that on to any of our kids. So, Jasmine? Yeah? I'm curious, after hearing this story, do you feel any differently about whether you would change your name if your name were Hitler? That's interesting. Hmm. You know, ultimately, I'd probably have to say that I'm less brave than these women are. I probably would change my name. Yeah, me too, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a coward. I'm a cowardly Hitler. Well, from one cowardly Hitler to another, um, just so we can go out on a happy note, can I play you one final Hitler anecdote that yes. uh, Leanne told me? Okay, here it goes. I had a gal that moved in up the street from me, and she'd asked me if I would help her kids get the proper testing that needed to be done to prove that her kids really could go into the grades that they said they could. So we got over to the school, and the school psychologist's name was Phobia. And I, just, I started in my mind, I'm just... I could hardly suppress the chuckles. And then I go, no, 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 stop, Leanne. You can't laugh. But phobia and a psychologist, I thought, that was a match made in heaven. And I'm laughing. And the gal that I was with just was going, what is going on? And so we get out of the school. And I just said, I am so, so, so sorry that I started chuckling about that psychologist's name. I should never, ever make fun of anybody and I said, I, I shouldn't make any fun. I've got the worst maiden name in the world. And she says, well, so what's your maiden name? And so I said, well, it's Hitler. And she literally drops to the lawn laughing. She's going, you got to be kidding me. And I said, no, no, no. I'm apologizing for making fun of a name. She goes, no, no. And she can barely even get a breath. And then she says, no, no. My maiden name was Heil. And so I literally dropped to the ground and we're both just laughing hysterically on the front lawn thinking that here was Heil and Hitler together. Big thanks to Joe, to Leanne and the Sue for sharing their stories with the Snap. And if you're wondering about the elusive Timothy Hitler, Joe did eventually manage to track him down. He declined an interview, citing privacy concerns, so we've changed the first half of his name as a precaution. But if you want to learn more about other people named Hitler, including Leanne and Sue's dad, Gene, be sure to check out director Matt Ogins' fascinating Showtime documentary, Meet the Hitlers. 
in which he interviews Hitlers from all over the world. MattOgens.com will have all the necessary links at snapjudgment.org. The original score for that piece was by Renzo Gorio, production assistance by Jasmine Aguilera, and yes, that story by Joe Rosenberg was produced by Joe Rosenberg. In a moment, they were just going to go for a drive. That's all. Just a drive. When the notorious episode continues, stay tuned. WNYC Studios, welcome back to Snap Judgment, the notorious episode. My name is from Washington, and you know that some people, they seek attention, glory, and all that. But our flip side is from someone who most of the time would much rather be left alone. Luz Vamenda Uzri Carpenter was recorded live at Seattle's production of Power from the mouth of the Occupy. It was the beginning of summer 2015, a few months ago. I got a call from my former roommate, Nicola Ayele. What are you doing, sis? I said nothing, even though I was doing something. Because this question usually preceded her, me picking her up and us going on some adventure. Our long car rides were like, let's catch up on our dream times, reminding each other why we mattered as we traveled from home to work and work to home. She would nag me about taking care of myself and I would nag her about treating herself better. On that night, it was the usual teasing and laughing and sage advice, along with unconditional love without judgment, letting it all hang out, just being ourselves. There was a lot of side eyes and eye rollings, and mm-hmm, what are you doing now? She would tease me about my hoopty car and I would tease her about all the stuff she had in the back seat of my car. <laughs> we talked about Netflix and random shows, family, dating, relationships and work struggles. On that night, we were on I-5 heading north. We pulled off the Everett exit because we wanted to get something to eat before I dropped her off at her uncle's house. I took a few wrong turns and became frustrated. I saw this large truck go over this meridian, so I decided to follow the truck. I got stuck on this meridian and my car was kind of like a seesaw. And about a foot of my car, of my rear, was in traffic. At first, we laughed. My car, and Nicola, and me, we always seemed to get into one adventure or another, or trouble. So I called AAA, and they said that I needed to call 911 for a faster response and that the cop car could block oncoming traffic because we were actually in danger. As we sat there undecided about calling the cops, a black man ran across traffic and said, he almost hit us, we need to get out of the car, it's really dangerous. He went to his car, he got a reflector, and he put it on the rear of my car to warn oncoming traffic. His name was Lejean. We called 911 and gave them detailed information about what happened. The drivers around us were frustrated. They didn't stop. Nicola, always the more positive of us, stated, I was, I'm not gonna worry about these angry white people. I'm just gonna worry about Lejean because black people always have black people's back. We saw an Everett Police Department car approach with lights flashing. I felt relief. I was like, yes, my car is going to be safe. And Nicola remembered feeling safe because of this female police officer. And usually, interactions with male police officers went worse. What happened here? Whose car is this? What's going on? She started firing rapid fire questions. She did not ask us if we were okay. She did not ask us if we were safe. We both tried to explain. At some point, I was like, this cop. I'm tired of explaining. Nicola, she kept going, the more calmer of us trying to explain. <laughs> then I heard, get your hands out of your pockets. Me and Lejean looked at her, and I remember her hand going to her jacket, and you could see her gun on her right hip, and it remained there. Me and Lejean, we put our hands up. But Nicola, she kept putting her hands out, still trying to remain calm. 
She was using her social worker voice to calm the cop down. She was playing the caretaker role, taking care of me, this light-skinned woman, as well as Lejean as a black man. What were you all doing here? What happened, the cop said. Nicola said, are you ready for me to speak? I remember her chin lifting with quiet dignity and I remember the cop getting angrier. But this is common to do. You don't ask people to listen if they're not willing to listen. It's the basics of anger management and de-escalation skills. She was waiting to see if this cop would listen. The cop's response was instant and angry. I'm not here for your attitude. Tell me how this happened. And Nicola said again, are you ready for me to speak? The cop looked angrier and more frantic. I remember numbing out and being silent. All I could see were her eyes and her right hand on her gun. She was panicking. She was escalating. And she said, are you ready to drop your attitude, she said. That's when Nicola didn't move anymore. It was a standoff. The cop's eyes were wild and her hand was on her gun. All our hands were in the air. She didn't believe us. How do we explain and not move? All expression and life died. There was no sound. There was no background noise. We did not breathe. My neck was stiff from trying to keep my hands in the air. I thought I was going to die. I thought we were going to die. This cop had all the power and we were trying to keep her calm. I started praying and asking my ancestors to come and my hands went higher. Usually I do this to pray and ask for God to come. I tilted my head back to the sky and I said, dear God, please give me the words, please. Dear God, help. I actually started praying for the cop. I said, God, please see us as not dangerous. Please see us as human. Calm her down. Tell me the words to say. And then I heard a voice in my head and it said, be small, be small. We called you. I blurted, we need you. We called 911. We need you. We called you. And there's something that snapped in her eyes. And she says, oh, I can help you. <laughs> you know, you can't blame me with everything happening these days. I just want to get home to my kids. I was shocked because this was in reference to black people being shot by police, but she was scared of us. She felt threatened by us. We who were helpless, we who had called for help, we had no guns. I did not cry. Nicola did not cry. We held it all in. The cop became chatty and friendly. She helped us off the meridian. Lejean waved his hands in front of her face. He said, hey, I was cold. I just want you to know that I was cold. That's why my hands were in my pockets. It was almost to reassure her. Nicola still didn't move, didn't speak. I swear I did not hear her breathe for about 10 minutes. She was frozen. Finally, we got into our car, we held hands and the cops watched us slowly drive away. As we were further down the road, Nicola began to cry silent tears, and I also began to cry. There was no sound, just water falling. I finally pulled into her uncle's complex, and we sat there in the parking lot, crying and holding hands and holding each other. She made me promise not to tell anybody and not for her, so her family wouldn't know. She said, do not post this on Instagram or Facebook. We found Lejean on Facebook and said, thank you. Finally, as we sat there for an hour or so, 
we made sure that her eyes were wiped so that she could enter her uncle's house with no tears. Big love. To lose Amanda Uzuri Carpenter for your story, it came to us from production of Power from the mouths of the occupied in Seattle. Directed by Patrice Cullors and C. Davida Ingram. Thank you. Snappers, it's about that time. But know this, stories are life and we've got the water. Subscribe to the amazing Snap Judgment Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcast, get this one. Facebook, Twitter, join the Snap Nation conversation, speak up. Now, the Snap was produced by the most notorious squad in the business. Flash the cameras at the Uber producer, Mr. Mark Ristich. The paparazzi's worst nightmare, Pat Masidi Miller, Anna, TMZ Sussman, Joe Knows, Paris Hilton Rosenberg, Davy, Lamborghini, Kim, Nancy, Red Carpet Lopez, Liz Mack knows, Adiza Egan, Eliza Smith is on a cleanse, the DJ, Renzo Gorio, Leon White Bronco Morimoto, Tail All Night to Cot, and Jasmine Aguilera makes pancakes with a very special ingredient. Now, you may have heard that this is not the news. No way is this the news. In fact, you could watch someone actually on the news, call it fake news, but we're not news. And even then, you would still not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is WNYC.